Welcome to the session, everybody. And um, so I'm going to start off by asking Mahendra the question, uh, what, what is AI and um, how, how is it created? Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, that AI is basically a machine uh, performing human uh, cognitive function. It tries to imitate brain function. The underlying uh, uh, underlying dimensions, what uh, machines uh, use in this perspective is data, certain hypotheses, uh, learning algorithms and resource and certain processes. Uh, in this perspective, like uh, machine learning is the core capability when we talk about AI. We are talk uh, like there are various uh, types of machine learning, supervised, unsupervised, and uh, reinforcement kind of learning algorithms where machine either uh, get supervision from a human to understand certain pattern or it can identify certain patterns by itself uh, and uh, particularly if we consider reinforcement kind of uh, learning algorithm now ai has the capability to uh, aware on the environment and learn based on certain policies and values that human created so because of that human is kind of a humans play a pivotal role when uh, creating ai and uh, drive the ai in right directions creating values otherwise uh, ai perhaps not able to uh, achieve what we want to achieve uh, in terms of creating values now i know that alan you are uh, leading uh, lawyer and look into neurotech and neurotech is now emerging as one of the uh, key dimensions in AI. Now, uh, how you see uh, the future of neurotech and AI and what kind of synergy that these two technologies uh, uh, bring into uh, when creating values? So I can start off with a current application. So um, some, some of uh, newer technology um, is has a therapeutic aim so it's aimed at addressing um say uh neurological conditions so one uh, currently fda approved application uh, in the us is is for drug resistant epilepsy so if somebody is um an ep is getting epileptic fits and the um their fits are not responding to medication as well as is to be hoped uh, they can get a brain implant and the brain implant, most of the time it does nothing. It just monitors the brain, uh, but it has an AI dimension because it uses a machine learning approach to identify the neural precursors to an epileptic fit. And uh, when it um, notices those neural precursors, it um, acts to stimulate the brain and to um, you know, hopefully stop the epileptic fit, or uh, at least um, stop most of them. And so it's it can be um, an effective treatment for some people who other treatments aren't aren't working. And it's it's currently being used. It's in some people's heads in 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 the US, for example. And uh, moving into the future. Uh, the hope is that it's not just epilepsy. I mean, already there's, um, you know, uh, neurotech is used in various other neurological conditions and um, moving into psychiatric co conditions like um, forms of uh, depression. And so the hope is that um, a range of um, uh a range of sort of medical psychiatric conditions can be treated, maybe ranging from Alzheimer's to epilepsy to uh, locked in syndrome to Parkinson's to depression to anxiety, even things like schizophrenia one day. And so um, there's a fair bit of commercial interest in it uh, as a result of um, partly of this, uh, this therapeutic dimension. Um, so, uh, uh, and of course, um, there's not just um, there's not just therapeutic uh, applications. There's also um, non-therapeutic applications. So people use neurotech for 
uh, gaming, um, although I'm not sure how good the technology is at the moment, but uh, it might one day become a good way of getting into the metaverse uh, using some sort of um, brain reading device. And um, the other applications are in the workplace. So there are some uh, companies that have used uh, brain monitoring neurotech. So that's not implanted in the brain, it's external to monitor, say, the um, attention of a uh, heavy goods vehicle driver or uh, um, air traffic controller for signs of inattention. So it's a sort of health and safety type thing to try and prevent accidents. And then further, further to that, there's uh, neurotech in the military context. There's the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency in America has uh, long been um, looking at neurotech and you know it might be possible for a soldier either with a brain implant or an external brain reading device to say for example control a drone swarm uh, maybe with some aug augmented reality glasses moving through the battlefield without having to control the drone swarm using using his or her hands um, uh, or, or it may be also possible to um, stimulate brains to um, increase uh, attention. Uh, but um, just moving back more generally to, to AI, um, you've uh, been thinking a lot about the, um, you know, what AI might be used for and, and what uh, its advantages and disadvantages are. You know, I've talked specifically about neurotech, but um, looking more more generally to to AI, you know what you know what what are what are its advantages and disadvantages? What should yeah, you I th be thinking about? Uh, thank you, Alan. I think uh, like uh, when it comes to neurotech, like uh, human brain uh, is uh, performing a key function, uh, like uh, working with other sensors, like to ha having awareness. Now, I think uh, consciousness also a subject. Nowadays in AI, uh, making AI sentient and people talk quite a lot. Now, when it comes to general context of the AI, uh, we are more, uh, there are some other areas coming in economic benefits as well as benefits to sustainability. Now, uh, people identified AI can contribute quite a lot in uh, pr productivity, in the, enhancing the productivity of the businesses, as well as uh, creating new uh, revenue streams uh, like uh, because there are quite a lot of data now gathered through uh, human and machine interactions and it uh, it identifies certain patterns and uh, strategists now looking blue, blue ocean strategy to create uh, new revenue streams and integrate that with the digital workspace now that's a quite uh, opportunity and it says like by 2030 ai can contribute to more than 15 percent uh, uh, world uh, GDP growth, and it is equivalent to something like uh, more than uh, 15 trillion uh, US dollars. That's significant. At the same mm. time, AI is coming in uh, as a contributor to the sustainable development goals, and research mm. identified more than 79% of United Nations uh, sustainable development goal targets can be uh, drive with the capability in AI which is quite uh, significant uh, Very now significant, yeah. yeah so that's uh, uh, that's uh, while that is the uh, uh, benefit uh, ai is also uh, like uh, work as like a double edged sword because there are significant risks for humanity now if you look into uh, certain areas like autonomous weapons you mentioned the defense but uh, there are certain areas like developing autonomous weapons which uh, significantly violate uh, human dignity at the same time it creates toby walsh has been talking about that hasn't he yeah exactly now. yeah exactly yeah. At, the, at the same time uh, uh, social and economic inequalities i mentioned like there are 15 uh, percent gdp growth but uh, when we analyze further we can see like that uh, GDP growth is not uniformly distribu distribute across globe. Mm -hmm. Some of the developed countries get more share than developing countries. 
particularly like if we compare United States, China compared to Africa, we can see this uh, uh, discrepancy. Now that's so, uh, at the same. Ex exacerbating existing inequities then or exactly yeah so that that's yeah. that's a, that's a significant risk like uh, deep fake uh, socio economic inequality biases caused because of the data so that is why uh, governance and ethics are very important and it's uh, in uh, leaders in board level or senior management level or even in the operational level uh, we need to establish the right uh, risk appetite and establish the right strategies to govern these uh, AI initiatives for uh, creating uh, the value for humanity. Now, coming back to the neurotech, now this is a significant area that uh, uh, develop in future in, in line with AI. What kind of risks, why, what are the areas that audience should aware when we talk about neurotech? So um, I think there's quite a lot. To, there's quite a lot to think about. So, so one one thing is um, the epilepsy device that I um, described earlier. So, so one of the things it might do is collect brain data to um, share with um, the medical advisors. And of course, that, that seems a good thing. You know, like it might be. The brain data might be useful to decide on further treatment or discontinuing treatment or, you know, for a number of reasons. Um, but one thing to bear in mind is these these de devices, generally neural devices, um, uh, store data and then there becomes a privacy dimension to it. So uh, data might be um, used for one purpose to treat treat the condition, but then perhaps it can be remined uh, for some other purpose. And of course, you know, if you think about things like hacking, then um, there's the uh, security uh, dimension to safeguarding data. And it, it may well be that uh, given the kind of inferences that could be made from brain data, it's especially, um, especially sensitive, you know, maybe even a bit more than other forms of kind of medical data and there's a question as to whether the privacy um, rules are are still fit for purpose uh, and then another issue is um, you know is sort of the combination of data so let's say a, a company has got both um, data from social media and also neural data and those these sources of data are combined and uh, I'm using social social media, and let's say I'm also using some form of neurotech, then that company starts to know a lot about me, and they already knew quite a lot about me because of the um, the other data, and now you add the neural data to it, and really a concern is, is one relating to uh, manipulation. Uh, so it might be easier to influence people's behavior in a consumer setting or uh, perhaps in a even a political setting or a workplace setting uh, so so that's that's um, one um, aspect then the other aspect is um, you know you mentioned inequality and then uh, let's say some people uh, start to use uh, neurotech and uh, others can't afford it then uh, and let's say neurotech um, can cognitively enhance or provide some capacities that are advantageous in the workplace or in business or, or in some other competitive debate, then you might end up with this kind of divide between people that are, uh, you know, um, getting some people that are kind of almost becoming transhuman, uh, you know, starting to have capacities that others don't have. And there's issues of inequality and also perhaps discrimination against people that haven't got uh, neurotech. Um, so there's actually quite a lot to think about it. And the um, just recently, um, the Law Society of England and Wales uh, published a report that I wrote on. Uh, that was the first one where a law body has addressed the uh, legal issues. Um, and I've just come back from Istanbul. I was talking to the Istanbul Bar Association about it. The UN's Human Rights Council, they've just asked for uh, 
they just resolve that they need a, a report on it to think about the human rights implications of neurotech. So there's there's really quite a lot to think about um, in relation to neurotech. And given this commercial excitement, it's uh, probably probably I think it would be a mistake to delay the thinking and uh, and also um, actions probably needed legal action. Yeah. Um, but um, again, so that's a sort of specific example of, um, of, of, of a technology that's uh, generally also facilitated by AI and some of the, the legal um, and ethical issues. But um, it sort of raises the question of more generally of, um, of, of governance. And uh, so, you know what? Thinking more generally about AI, what? Why do we need AI governance? Uh, you know, apart from just in the context of of, uh, of neurotech, um, what kind of strategy should businesses be responsible? I mean, of of course, laws and can be made to um, uh, to direct a new technology, but. Um, you know, hopefully, hopefully, businesses might also be minded to to do that. So, yeah, what? Why do we need AI governance? What kind of strategy do we need to ensure um, more generally responsible AI? Yeah, I think uh, as I explained before, like there is a benefits and risks uh, related to AI, which is quite uh, that we we need to uh, govern uh, while managing risks. We need to establish the right strategy to create uh, best value for humanity. I think in this perspective, the like bias is some kind of a, one of the main reason that creating uh, risks in AI. So uh, organizations need to think what, how and what kind of cultural dimensions and what kind of uh, people and culture should uh, drive towards the uh, driving AI projects and initiatives, for example, in this perspective, if we look into United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, we need to look into uh, diversity, equity, inclusion aspects uh, to mitigate biases. Uh, we need to look into uh, gender equality and also reduce inequalities in the workspace and uh, uh, decision-making processes uh, related to AI creation, which uh, effectively mitigate biases in uh, data and uh, selection of the algorithms and establishing processes. That's part of the governance and also establishing the right risk appetite and also uh, uh, looking into ethical dimensions. Now, uh, in when it comes to organizations, we now know there are quite a lot of regulations, compliance and policies em uh, emerging to control the AI. At the same time, there is a, a, a ethics which is coming the first place uh, before the law, that uh, how we uh, orchestrate people and culture to establish the right ethics uh, towards responsible AI and explainable AI. I uh, yeah, so that's... I, th that's I think that's a good point. You know, like, law can do some things, but um, it shouldn't be all down to law. You know, there's, there's something that businesses can do. In exactly. So, for example, uh, there are different aspects of utilitarianism and consequentialism perspective of ethics play a role in AI. For example, if you look into uh, uh, consequentialism perspective, as I mentioned before, there is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, can be supported with uh, AI and, and uh, the practitioners can look into sustainability through the lens of AI and support, which is quite a, a play an ethical role uh, in uh, from AI perspective. At the same time, uh, we need to look into a, how AI works in terms of data, people, and processes, and we need to establish right uh, uh, AI uh, creation process in utilitarian some perspective of ethics uh, to drive uh, human values uh, in this process. Uh, so it's it's a Part of the AI, there are like uh, different various strategies, operations, custom experience, brand, and sustainability in related to organizations. So there are uh, quite a lot of uh, frameworks emerging 
uh, but for particularly uh, ESG frameworks aligning with the data science. And I, I uh, uh, created a few frameworks and I presented in certain frameworks in United Nations to supporting the sustainable development goals through AI. And there are some of the regulations and policies are emerging uh, how to regulate certain aspects. For example, autonomous uh, related job losses and uh, uh, significant uh, risks, uh, which can mm. be controlled through government, uh, uh, government participation. At the same time, uh, there are like uh, biases and inequalities create and there are like democratization strategies, uh, which can be uh, integrated through the compliance and policies. I think uh, that the AI ethics and governance is uh, uh, is very important that uh, to drive these capabilities for creation, creating human values and uh, driving human values in this process. Now, coming back to neurotech now, we know like in neurotech that uh, when we talk about uh, deep neural networks we are talking about neurons and brain is now completely a neural network and we are now talking about something uh, interfacing this to, these two in the technology and the brain aspect and then driving this uh, uh, emerging technology uh, while we are leveraging the ai capabilities which is actually a groundbreaking now at the same time, now you are a lawyer and you are teaching uh, criminal law. Now we know like when it comes to criminal law, there's a mens rea, guilty mind, uh, play a role uh, when uh, uh, judge certain action uh, beyond reasonable doubt. And how you see this neuro neurotech and neurotechnology technologies interfacing with the brain uh, and people's action? Uh, how they are relates with the criminology? What's the dimension uh, of these aspects in the criminal criminal law perspective? So I, I think there's actually quite a lot of um, there's quite a lot of criminal law dimensions to to neurotech, and and actually um, I, I I don't think that's unusual. I, I suspect you know like if you looked at other areas of law, there would be neurotech would raise a lot of issues, but. Um, you know, although I used to be a commercial litigator, my my focus, is, as you mentioned, is, is on teaching criminal law at the moment. But, um, you know, so one question is the uh, criminal act. Uh, so you, you mentioned the mens rea, the guilty mind, but uh, the prosecution have got, got to prove that. And they also have to prove um, that the defendant carried out uh, the actus reus, which is most commonly an act. And most commonly, it's a... Uh, bodily act like people generally act through their bodies you know they they throw punches they fire use their finger to fire a trigger or they utter words using their um using their the muscle systems in their mouths or they nod their head and things like that uh, but the the brain computer interfaces create the possibility of acting in a way that doesn't use the body. So a person might be able to say, for example, control a drone, a brain drone. And in America, they have brain drone racing now. That's a, something that already happens. The universities compete with each other to compete uh, with drones, but somebody could fly a drone into someone else. And let's say they've got the guilty mind, they've got the intention to kill. Um, but it's a slightly non-standard actus reus because they haven't used their body. And that's a rather strange question for the criminal law. And then you can imagine neurotech being used at sentencing. So, for example, um, you know, per perhaps a person with a, some form of mental illness that's not enough for the mental health and cognitive impairment uh, defense, and they're getting sentenced. And so now, uh, instead of sending them uh, to jail, what can happen now is uh, a person might say, well, the, you know, the lawyer might say, well, my client uh, is, is going to be under the direction of professor, you know, psychiatrist, and also um, the, they're going to keep taking the antipsychotic medications. So why don't you just um, allow them to serve the, the, the sentence in the community, and not, um, 
not not send them to jail and just make them promise to uh, keep taking the meds. Well, you could you could imagine a similar thing happening with a brain computer interface that maybe acts to stimulate the brain to say stop an angry outburst and it monitors the brain all this all the time. And then, of course, we're now into the thinking about the human rights dimension of all of this, um, which are, is, you know, this is the kind of thing that caused the, the United Nations Human Rights Council to recently resolve that they want a report. And then, you know, for more traditional um, kind of offences, um, of course, uh, I'm so I'm old enough to remember when the law side to inter, start to um, wrestle with the widespread use of the internet. And so one of the things that had to happen was uh, hacking offences were created. And really, uh, as we know, hacking is very much in the news, increasingly so now, and there's various offences. Uh, but then hacking into a database and stealing some data seems different, perhaps in a qualitative way from, say, hacking mm -hmm. into someone's neural device and perhaps causing it to electrically stimulate them. So there might need to be new hacking offences. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think uh, the upshot of it is that, um, you know, that sort of AI systems are is one of the things that is driving... Um, the advances in neurotech it's not the only thing also advances in understanding the brain but these things are are leading to um a range of issues for the criminal law for human rights um you know employment law so for example brain monitoring what's the can can you say no if your employer asks you to wear a brain reading device and you know there's a lot a lot for lawyers to think about and it's it's good that that this kind of thing is is starting to uh, to to happen. So really, it's uh, like the the sort of developments that um, you're more familiar with in conjunction with developments in uh, in in neurotech are starting to increasingly create yeah. in, in interesting problems and questions for 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 lawyers and ethicists and uh, regulators. Yeah. That's it's a yeah it's a very complex complex domain. Now, can you a little bit uh, tell something about related to metaverse because metaverse is emerging and it is now not uh, not only uh, the physical environment physical environment what we are interact but people are now working metaverse and AI is like a cornerstone in metaverse uh, because it capture quite a lot of our data and then uh, it will. Uh, uh, help uh, help people to uh, transform our perceptions, our emotions through the digital workspace. So, how you see like what kind of complexities uh, it might emerge when metaverse and AI integrated mm -hmm. and uh, creating work workspace? Yeah. So, um, for example, I think um, Facebook a while ago they acquired Control Labs, which is a neural interface company. I think that's part of their reality labs at, at meta as it is now um you know so there's some combining of neural interface it's not a brain computer interface it's a interface that interfaces with the um the, the arm and gets reads neural activity from the arm uh but you can you know it might it might turn out that um you know rather than wearing a big sort of clunky headset it might be that uh, a neural device is a good way of getting into the metaverse. And then, of course, um, you know, all the privacy manipulation issues uh, start to emerge from that. So I think it's, a, you know, perhaps the, those two technologies might go together. Perhaps they might not, but that seems to be a possibility and um it would it would raise these uh privacy manipulation type issues maybe also the inequality and uh and the hacking and yeah everything all these issues could 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 uh come up in that context so alan uh, finally now we talk about ai we talk about uh, consciousness in ai we talk about how ai can in uh, interface with brain through neurotech and we talk about ethics and governance and and you mentioned quite a lot of risks in here now 
looking into future what might be the new professions should emerge to supporting these uh, new dimensions of uh, technology these emerging technologies are quite complicated and perhaps that uh, our classic uh, way of looking the the capabilities might not uh, enough to uh, govern and manage these what are the new roles uh, and new what are roles. what kind of human augmentation that might be applied okay. So um, I haven't thought generally about new roles. The, 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 the one thing that I have thought about is legal roles. So um, since, you know, when I was, I used to be a commercial litigator and there was a very sort of routine job that junior lawyers like me used to do. And that was uh, discovery, deciding which documents need to be um, given to the other side in a legal dispute and which ones don't uh, before, you know, in, as part of the legal process in a civil matter. And um, so now sort of AI systems have um, started to be employed in that area and some of the big firms are, are, are using them. And there's a question, you know, how far up the chain of legal work um, will AI systems go? And um, that 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 question is not a, just a theoretical question. It's a very sort of practical question for law firms, and they're um, spending money on these systems that reduce labor costs. And clients are want that. You know, they want they they don't want to pay for lots of lawyers working on something that's really quite routine. And now these AI systems are doing it. And as a result of that, one of the things that's happened in 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 uh, law firms is the rise of the these people who are sort of or in the legal profession is the rise of people who you might think of as legal technologists and these are people that um you know they might have a background in they might not even be qualified in law they might have a background in data science or something like that and yet they're very useful in law because they they can work with these systems and this is doing some legal work uh, and then I, I guess, um, you know, one of the things I thought about in my my um, paper for the Law Society of England and Wales is that um, someone like a legal technologist, uh, so let's say lawyers start using newer technology and they, they, they use it for billing, maybe instead of billable hours, there's billable attention, so you only pay for uh work when your lawyer is paying attention or something like that or uh maybe even lawyers um start competing with each other and use neurotech to increase their attention so they can pay attention for longer which would be useful or or, or to stimulate their brains to try and remember stuff more easily and things like that well you know like maybe there could be a role for a legal neurotechnologist uh but that's this is really quite a bit speculative but you know um there's there's the there are these people working in law firms that weren't working there when i was there there was just there was the it department and lawyers but now there's this kind of uh legal technology thing and you know that perhaps that something like that could happen but um, yeah qu quite interesting yeah beyond ethics and governance there is a policy in the policies compliance and legal perspective there is a quite a lot of uh areas that uh, law need to play in related to this uh, AI. Uh, thank you, Alan. And it is a quite informative uh, discussion. Uh, yeah. I think uh, audience has taken quite a lot of information. Thank you. I've enjoyed it too. And thanks. Thanks for uh, the, the use. Great discussion. Thanks very much.